It's good to be with you this morning. Are you ready to study the Word of God? Yes? Okay, we're going to wait a little bit until they bring the, the pulpit here because I can't do more than two things with one hand. So. Thank you, sir. Great worship this morning, wasn't it? Isn't it good to be in the presence of the Lord? And I love to worship. Goodness. It's so good to have Jenny and, and, and Justin here. Where where'd they go? Oh, there's Jenny. I was looking for Justin. I'm like, what happened? There you go. Oh, it's so good now to have you here and to have your family here. It's awesome. I've been to Guatemala. I've seen the project in Batania, and uh, let me tell you, they've gone above and beyond of what I saw, what, two years ago or so. That was back when I had good eyes to see. So I, I, it was good. It's a good work, and uh, we need to join them in that work. And hopefully soon we'll be flying down there again. We need to do that. Well, today we're going to be talking about uh, marriage. And uh, we're going to talk about fighting for your marriage. Last week we started a series called Fight for the Family. So today we're going to focus a little bit on marriage. And before you tune me out, okay, let me say, if you're not married, maybe you were and you're not anymore, or you're not planning to get married, or, or you want to get married, or whatever the reason may be, you still need to listen to this message. Because we all have people around us, whether friends or family members, that perhaps will get married or are getting married, and they need to understand the truth of what it is a covenant marriage and a biblical marriage. So this morning, don't tune me out. I want you to take notes so that you can talk to your kids, your grandkids, your nephews, your nieces, your neighbors, anyone that you know that is going to get married. And if you are planning on getting married one day, hey, start applying it from now. Okay? You ready? So today I have the privilege of talking about fighting for your marriage, and this, this is a subject very near and dear to my heart. And the reason I say that is because Xiaomi and I, well, I could say Xiaomi, had to fight for our marriage. We had to fight for our marriage. You see, when, when, when I came to, to our marriage, I came with the wrong mentality. And, and the only reason, really, that Xiaomi and I are married today is because of the grace of God and because of the stubbornness of that little woman right there. Okay? Uh, you see, I, I came to it thinking about myself. I grew up in Puerto Rico, and we were like a chauvinist, uh, uh, macho, mucho macho culture. And I thought I was the most macho of all the machos. So I came thinking, listen, as long as I give her a roof over her head, clothes to wear, and food, she should be a happy camper. And then Jose can go do whatever he wants. Well, obviously, Xiaomi had a different mentality than that. I don't understand why. <laughs> but honestly, I, I came into the marriage with a, with a me mentality. It's all about me. And I couldn't care less about anything else. Uh, I won't go into details because it will be a long, long message. But uh, if you think that I'm the only one that goes into marriage that way, you're wrong. As a matter of fact, I will bet that most of us go to marriage with that mentality. As a matter of fact, in 2010, a lady by the name of Tara Parker Pope wrote the following. She said, the notion that the best marriages are those that bring satisfaction to the individual may seem counterintuitive. After all, she asked the question, isn't marriage supposed to be about putting the relationship first? And then she answers, not anymore. She said, for centuries, marriage was viewed as an economic and social institution, and the emotional and intellectual needs of the spouse were secondary to the survival of the marriage itself. But in modern relationships, people are looking for a partnership, and they want partners who make their lives more interesting. Therefore, marriage used to be about us, but it's now about me. And the title of the report was, A Happy Marriage is a Me Marriage. That is the idea that the culture has about marriage. We're looking for a partnership. We're looking for a contract where my interests are front and center. And I will venture to say that that is the reason why almost 50% of our marriages end up in divorce. It sure was the reason why mine in 1989 ended up in divorce court. Today I want to spend some time 
talking about what is a biblical marriage and what, what is a covenant. When I say biblical marriage, I'm talking about a covenant relationship, a covenant marriage. So I want to talk about what is a biblical marriage. I want to spend some time defining that. Uh, Pastor Brian last week gave us a great foundation. He said that marriage was designed, created, and instituted by God to produce image bearers of God. You remember that? That is a great foundation of what marriage is. So today I want to explain what, what is a biblical marriage or a covenant, what is a covenant relationship, and then is it worth fighting for the marriage and why? Okay, are you ready for that? Okay, so point number one in your outlines. A biblical marriage is one guided by the principles of Scripture. A biblical marriage is one guided by the principles of Scripture, okay? If your marriage is not guided by the principles of Scripture, it is not a biblical marriage. See, in August 4th, 1984, Siomara and I were married, and we were legally married, but we did not have a biblical marriage. I'm going to use the definition of Tim Keller. It's a great author that, that we read often, but he says that a biblical marriage is a permanent, exclusive Public legal commitment to share your life together. We need to listen to that again. He says it's a permanent, exclusive, public legal commitment to share your lives together. And this is a great definition. Okay? It's a great definition. Uh, a marriage must fulfill all the aspects of this definition right there. It's got to be, if you have a legal commitment but it's not permanent, it's not a biblical marriage. Okay? As a matter of fact, I don't know if you've heard, but they have now what is called a renewable marriage contract. Anybody heard about that? Renewable marriage contract is a lease for marriage. You know, you know how you lease your car? Every two or three years you go just change it for another one. They have that for marriage. I'm not joking. Google it. You'll see it. Renewable marriage contract. You marry for two years. If you don't like it, you get a new model. You're done. If you like it, you renew it. And you keep going for another two years. <laughs> what a deal. Uh, anyways, <laughs> if, <laughs> if the marriage is permanent but it's not exclusive, then it's not a biblical marriage either. Okay? So it must be permanent. It must be forever. That's why we say in the marriage vow, until death do us part. It must be permanent. Okay? It must be exclusive. Otherwise, it's considered adulterous, right? It's an adultery. Uh, so it's got to be exclusive, it's got to be permanent, it's got to be legal, it's got to be approved by the state. And it must be a commitment to share all of our lives together. Listen, you cannot have secrets in your marriage. You've got to be completely transparent. You've got to share your life together. And I will venture to say, and this is only Jose's opinion, okay? Don't kill Pastor Brian for it. But I venture to say that if you have a prenup, that's not a biblical marriage because you, got, you must share your life together. It's got to have all of it. Be permanent, be exclusive, be legal, and be transparent. Recently, Sam and I had an opportunity to be at a wedding, and uh, we had the opportunity to sit with these young professionals. It was a very interesting conversation. As we got to talk to each other, uh, we noticed that most of these guys were engaged with their fiancés, but they have been living together. They were living together and they were not married. Only one of them was married. He had been married for a year. And the rest of them were all living together. So as Yomi was speaking to them, she asked the question, why is it that most of you are living together and not married? And one of the guys, the one that just got married a year ago, he points to his ring finger, to the ring, and he says, because of this. And she says, what do you mean because of that? He goes, this symbolizes a commitment. <laughs> it's funny. He says, this ring is a symbol of commitment, which is true. And this makes it more difficult to separate if you want to end the relationship. Therefore, we want to live together to make sure that this person is the right one. So, see, let me ask him, so, so you were not committed before, but now you are committed. He goes, oh, no, I was committed. I just wasn't committed for life. <laughs> okay. This was a, a two-year sentence, not a <laughs> life sentence. <laughs> and I, I suggest that the couples today uh, 
are experiencing this in the relationship because they are bringing the cultural mentality into the marriage. See, in the, mar in the culture, we have a consumer mentality. And we have brought it not only to the church, but we're bringing it into the marriage. And listen, we, there are two types of relationships. Right? You have a, cult, uh, a consumer relationship and you have a covenant relationship. And we all need to have both of them. Okay, nothing wrong with having both of them, okay? A consumer relationship is, for example, what I have with Publix, where shopping is a pleasure. <laughs> you see, when I go to my Publix, and I call it my Publix because I've left my money there for the last 20 years, so it might as well be mine. So when I go to my Publix in Cooper City, the people know me. I go in, I see Gene at the, at the back with the meat, and, hey, Gene, you want one pound or two pounds, sir? I'll take one pound. He already knows what I like. We even have casual conversations. Every now and then we just go and, and converse with the people. And when I go by myself, where's your wife? How come your wife is not with you? When she goes by herself, well, where's your husband? How come he's not here? They even had a manager. <laughs> he was funny. He knew I was a pastor. He actually came here a couple of times. And every time he saw me, he goes, Hallelujah. I'm like, okay, <laughs> welcome, how are you too? <laughs> but you know, when I go to Publix, if the Cafe Bustelo that I like so much is not buy one, get one, or if it's not two for five dollars, and Sedano's has it at one ninety nine, where am I going to buy my coffee at? Sedano's, right? Because I have a consumer relationship with Publix. As long as they have what I want at the price that I want, I'm good with them. But as long as somebody's cheaper, I'm sorry, baby. I'm going with the other one. Okay? That's a consumer mentality. It's a consumer relationship. And it's not bad. I need to have that type of relationship with Publix. But my family relationships and my marriage should not be one of them. It should not. See, God did not intend it for us to handle marriage like a consumer relationship. And he did not intend for one person to carry the responsibility of satisfying the other person completely. We can't do that. See, a biblical marriage is not a consumer relationship. A biblical marriage is a covenant relationship. A biblical marriage is a covenant relationship. Now, what, what is a covenant relationship? And we can spend a lot of time explaining this, and that's not the point this morning. But I want to read a passage in Deuteronomy 29. Just look at two aspects of a covenant relationship, and we'll move on. Okay, but if you have the Bibles on Deut Deuteronomy 29, we're going to read verse, starting in verse 2. Just to give you a little bit of uh, background. And we'll focus on verses 12 and 13. It says, And Moses summoned all of Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the line of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs and the great wonders. But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. Verse 9, Therefore, keep the words of this covenant... And do them that you may prosper in all that you do. You are standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders, and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourners who is in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, so that, verse 12, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today, that he may establish you today as his people, that he may be your God as he promised you, and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. It is not with you alone that I'm making this sworn covenant, but it's, it, it's with but who, with whoever is standing here with us today before the Lord our God and with whoever is not here with us today. We're not going to discuss the whole thing. I just want you to see a couple of aspects of what it is a covenant relationship because your relationship with God is a covenant relationship and therefore should be also 
your relationship and your marriage. I want you to look at verse 12 and see the language of love and intimacy in verse 12. He talks about him being your God and we being his people. You see, if I was to come in here and say, this is my Maya or my Sean or my Alessandra, immediately you will notice the love that I have for my grandkids because they are mine, right? I don't use that word for just anybody. This is my babies. This is my kids. This is my wife. And that is the language that we have in this covenant from God to his people. It's a language of love and a language of intimacy. But you also see in verse 12 a language of law. He says, we will be sworn this day. We will take an oath today. So there's a mixture, a blend of love and intimacy and law in a covenant relationship. There's a way that Tim Keller defined it to, to quote him again. He said, a covenant relationship is a relationship more loving and intimate than a merely legal re relationship, yet more binding and enduring and accountable than a merely personal relationship. You catch that? It's a relationship that is more loving and more intimate than just merely a contract between two people, yet more binding and enduring and accountable than merely living together than a personal relationship. See, our relationship with God is a covenant relationship. And Ephesians 5 says that the marriage is the representation of our relationship with God. Doesn't it? So if our relationship with God is a covenant relationship and my marriage should reflect my relationship with God, then my marriage should be a covenant relationship as well. I hope you understand that here this morning. See, our society doesn't have a category for a covenant relationship. As a matter of fact, I Google covenant marriage. There's only three states that have a law for covenant marriage. And the purpose of their covenant marriage is to make it harder for people to get divorced, basically. It says you can't get divorced for two years. You got to do this, that, the other in order to get divorced. So there's nothing in our, in our society for a covenant marriage. Why? Because we're always thinking about the individual benefits. That's it. Dr. Scott Hand defined it this way. He said a covenant is an exchange of persons as opposed to a contract, which is an exchange of promises. An exchange of persons instead of just an exchange of of promises. You see, a covenant marriage will say, I will do what I have to do regardless of what you do. That's what a covenant marriage says. That, that's the key. That's the key why Xiomara and I are still together today. Because in 1989, she looked at me in the face and says, I don't care what you are doing, I'm going to be married. I don't know what you're on, my friend, but I'm staying in this marriage. I got married for life. See, and there she was, having been humiliated by my action, looking at me and, and even looking at the judge and saying, listen, I don't know what he wants, but I got married for life. And she didn't even know what a covenant marriage was. But she stood there, and she stood her ground, and she did it to the point where the judge looked at us and said, you know what, kids? You go get counsel and come back in 90 days. If you want to get married, I'll, uh, you want to get divorced, I'll divorce you. And praise be to God, we never went back. He's still waiting for us. <laughs> I can imagine him. Where are these kids? <laughs> so we come to an important point. Why should we fight for our marriage? Is it worth the fight? Is it worth the fight? Let me tell you, do Sami and I have a perfect marriage? We don't. Do I have a perfect wife? Absolutely. Of course I do. Yeah, she is like, yeah, baby. Perfect. Does she have a perfect husband? Not at all. Not at all. But I'm sure we both would agree in saying that a biblical marriage is worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for. Why? Because it's God's institution. And because it is a permanent covenant of love 
in law between the couple and God. It's not just you and your husband or you and your wife. It's between you two and God. Look at what it says in Malachi 2.14. Pastor read it last week. Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth. See, God himself is the witness of our union in marriage. God himself dictated what we must do. Look at what he says in Matthew 19.5. He repeated it. He said it in Genesis 24 to 24, and he repeated it in Ephesians 5. But he says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. See, God not only designed, created, and instituted marriage. God designed, created, and instituted your marriage. See, the reason why Xiaomi and I are together is because he put us together. The reason you're together with your spouse today is because he put you together. And if the Lord brought us together, and if the Lord commanded us that a man and a woman will leave father and mother, and if the Lord commanded us to become one and not allow anything to separate us, and if the Lord said all of that, then I believe the marriage is worth fighting for. Amen? So how do we fight? I'm glad two of you are on it. <laughs> At least we got two marriages that are, are going to make it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so how do we fight? For this, we're going to go to Ephesians 5. So if you have a Bible, turn over to Ephesians 5. And let's look at some principles that we must follow in our marriages. And, and honestly, many of them in any relationship that we have. Okay? First things, first and foremost, you must be spirit-filled. You must be Spirit filled. If you don't hear anything else that I say from now until the end of the message, hear that. You must be spirit filled. Look at verse 18 on Ephesians 5. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. This means to be completely controlled by the Holy Spirit. This means to be completely submitted to the Holy Spirit. And this is the key. Okay, because this will give you the power to fight. This will give you the power to move forward. If you are not spirit-filled, you're not going to be able to make it. You can try for a little bit. It will work for a little bit. But it's not going to happen. You must be spirit-filled. And being spirit-filled will lead you to prayer. So your second point is to pray. Pray for and with each other. Pray for and with each other. You know, one of the mistakes we make in marriage is we try to change people. You know, Siomi was trying to change me. I was trying to change the Dominican to the Puerto Rican way, uh, which is the right way. But... Um, <laughs> That's going to cost me. <laughs> I'll say something later to fix it. <laughs> but many of us, that's what we try. If, if he could only change a little bit. You know, many times we get people counseling couples in my office. Or in, and, and, and they come, past, Pastor, but he is doing this, 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 and this. And I'll ask him, how has he changed? When you met him, was he doing those things? Yes. So you mean he hasn't changed? Yes. So why are you complaining? Right? If you met him that way, why are you complaining now? Right? We, we want to change the person. But you know what? You don't have the power or the ability to change anyone. Okay? Pray for your spouse. If you think they need to be changed, tell God, listen, God, can you change them? I, I promise you at the end of that prayer, you're going to end up saying, God, can you change me? Change me. Pray for your spouse and pray with your spouse. Nothing will bring you closer together than praying 
with and for each other. Okay? Secondly, you must live a life of submission. You must, must live a life of submission. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wife, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself his Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Submission speaks of servanthood. Okay, it, it, it talks about a servant's heart. This, this is somebody called the, the, lubric, the lubricant of marriage. You know how an engine, if you run an engine with no oil, with no lubricant, you know what's going to happen? Anybody tried it? I did it once. It was awesome. <laughs> that was the only time we drove that car. If, if you run an engine without oil, there, there's friction inside the oil, uh, inside the engine, I'm sorry. And the engine needs that oil in order to move the engine and to move the car forward. Okay? In the marriage, there is going to be friction. And you need the oil of a servant's heart to be able to move that marriage forward. And maybe you're saying, well, why is there friction on the marriage? I'll tell you a secret. You're married to a sinner. And before you laugh too hard, your husband or wife is also married to a sinner. And when you put two sinners together, you're going to have friction. Lots of friction in my case. And you need the oil of a servant's heart to be able to move it forward. And in this passage, passage it tells us that we are commanded, all of us, to submit to one another, it says in verse 21. It says in verse 22, wives, submit to your husband. And then on verse 25, it says, husband, you got to submit to Jesus. We are commanded to live a life of submission. We're to live with a servant's heart. Fourthly, you must love like Christ loves. You must love like Christ loves. And I put the word agape there. We always talk about agape love, right? It says in verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Husbands, this is sacrificial love. This says, I'm going to love you regardless of how I feel. This says, you can't do anything for me to love you more, and you can't do anything for me to love you less. I love you. That's what this says. This is true, unconditional, sacrificial, unbreakable love. This is laying your life down for your spouse. It says in 1 John 3.16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. And then in Philippians 2, it says, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. How more in marriage, right? Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. Taking the form of a servant. Listen, man, this love is not a feeling. This love is a decision. See, that changed my life. Because in 1989, believe it or not, I looked at that angel over there and I said, I never love you, I don't love you, and I never will. Because I wasn't feeling it. She said, I don't know what you're smoking, baby, but you're staying right here. In 1990, a, a group of men taught me this idea of love being a decision. Wow, that revolutionized my life. And that day I decided that forever I was going to love my wife. 
Men, today you need to make a decision. Women, you need to make a decision. The next one is that you must leave and cleave. You must leave and cleave. Ephesians 5.31 says, Therefore a man shall leave his mother and his father and mother and hold fast or cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What does it mean to leave and cleave or to leave and hold fast? You may be thinking, well, Jose, I already left my house, so I left. I'm good. Or maybe you left your house, but the house hasn't left you yet. You know, if, if you're financially dependent on your parents, you haven't left yet. If you're emotionally dependent on your parents, whether good experience or bad experience, you haven't left yet. You see, if you're going to your wife or your husband and say, you know, my mother used to do it this way, why don't you do it that way? Or my father used to do it this way, how come you're not like him? If you do that, you haven't left home yet. They, they got you. They're, they're grabbing you. They're taking hold of you. Okay? You must live. Live physically, financially, emotionally, and psychologically. You got to leave the old and make this new culture that you're creating by becoming one. Just like we are a new creation when Jesus saves us, he's put you into a new creation. This marriage is a new creation. And you know, the Puerto Rican way was definitely not going to work in my household. In the Dominican way, well, the food worked, but the rest didn't. <laughs> and we had to put things aside and say, we're not going to do it the Puerto Rican or the Cuban or the Dominican way. We're going to find our way. And when we decided to do it God's way, it created a new culture. A new culture within the marriage. That is becoming one. That is becoming one. Don't let anything hold you back. And, and listen, if there's anything hold you back right now, make a decision to leave. To leave it behind. It will ruin your marriage. Lastly, you must love and respect. Love and respect. It says in verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Listen, we all have many needs. And we're different. Men and women are different. We all have many needs. We all want to feel loved. We all want to feel cared for, right? Men, women need to feel loved. Right, ladies? Women need to feel loved. Men, you need to tell her that you love her. You need to show her that you love her. But tell her over, I mean, listen, if you have to tell her a thousand times a day, say it. I know some guys, but, but I don't need to hear it. Okay, you don't need to hear it, but she does. Okay? Tell her that you love her and show her. Because one thing is saying it and another thing is showing it. All right? Valentine's Day is what? See, all the women know exactly, five days away. We men are like, oh, what day is today? <laughs> Fair warning, guys. Five days. Show her that you love her. Tell her that you love her. She needs to hear it. Women. Men need to feel respected. I'll say that again. Men need to feel respected. Speak well of him in public. Okay? Treat him with respect at home. I know he's not perfect. We're not perfect. I know it. But you can still respect him. One of the things I hate the most, and, and I'm sorry to say it. If you're one of them, I'm sorry. Don't mean to offend anybody. But every now and then, a wife will stop back there with their husband, and they'll see me. Oh, Pastor Jose, how are you? And I hug him, and they start, you won't believe what this idiot just did. And she, they'll go off on the husband right there with everybody just walking by. Don't do that. Go to my office. We'll talk in the office. Hey, Pastor Jose, can I talk to you? And we'll go inside. Speak well of him in front of people. If you got nothing good to say, don't say nothing at all. But respect him. Stop gossiping to your friends about your husband. 
You know, sometimes women come and say, man, my friends even want to kill him. He's so bad. Well, of course they want to kill him. They want to protect you. He's such an idiot in their eyes that they want to kill him. Because all they hear is all the negative stuff. It's like this guy doesn't do anything right. Stop. Stop. One of the things I admired about Xiaomi, when we were having our problems, it was obviously public. Uh, my, my family knew it, her family knew it, and her family kept saying, Xiomara, just leave that guy and come up to Boston. We'll hear for you. We're here for you. We're here for you. One of the things I admire about her, is she would stand the ground and say, no. I know who he is. What he's doing right now is not who he is, and, and it's going to be okay. A and she kept her ground. Even when they were telling her, get out of there. And many of the people are getting, trying to push you out of your marriage because of what they're hearing you say about your husbands. So be careful, ladies, what you said. Treat them with respect, okay? All right, to end today, I want to end with a challenge. I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge each one of you this morning to enter into a covenant relationship. First of all, with God, to understand that you are in a covenant relationship with God, but to enter into a covenant relationship with your spouse, to make the decision to love him until death do us apart, to love him no matter what. Decide today to submit to the Holy Spirit of God, Make a decision today to pray together, to pray for each other, to submit to one another out of reverence for God, to love one another with agape, sacrificial, unending love, to love and respect each other. And I challenge you to do that. If you do that, you have a fighting chance at a biblical marriage. I promise you. Would you pray with me? Lord, this morning I thank you for your word. I thank you that you didn't leave it to us to decide what is or what is not a good marriage. Lord, I am sorry for what I put my wife through. And I thank you for the opportunity that you gave us to build a relationship that will last forever. And not only that, but a relationship that has served as an example to others. And Father, I pray for the marriages in here this morning. I know that in a group like this, many of them, many of them have been going through difficult trials and tribulations. And Father, I pray that this morning the Holy Spirit will invade their marriage. That they will have the, the strength and the courage to make a decision to live a life of submission to the Holy Spirit. Because I know that if they do that, everything else will take care of itself. And Father, if this morning there's someone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, maybe they're just trying to do it on their own. I pray that today, O oh Holy Spirit, today, that you will convict them of their sin so that they will repent and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.